I think one high point, and this is maybe a little bit obvious, but those that haven't looked at it closely might be surprised to realize that there is real traction, like proven results around so-called AI in the context of e-commerce personalization. Like, if you do it right, you will get a bump um, yeah. in, in your online revenues if you figure out how to show people stuff that they care about. I know yeah. it sounds like freaking obvious. <laughs> Netflix obviously does it brilliantly in, yeah. in, in their sort of binge approach to the yeah. world. But you can kind of borrow and big borrow and steal from yeah. that type of thing. That stuff is definitely sticking to the wall. And so that's like, that's that's a high point. I think another interesting like high point um, is uh, opportunity I've seen is like, Amazon is sort of expanding into the sort of last mile stuff. They want to do their own deliveries. They want to... I had a horrible experience at my home because uh, they their delivery driver totally screwed up on a delivery and placed it inside a locked residential. Yeah. It was careless crap. And so I started investigating it, and what I figured out is Amazon's trying to not... I don't want to pay UPS to deliver my stuff. Yeah. Problem is, the UPS folks in my region have been doing it for 20 years. They know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. They're, they're u- Amazon's Uberizing this with a bunch of like low-paid drivers that don't know what the yeah. hell they're doing. And and Amazon is judging them based on the amount of deliveries they make in a given day, right? Yeah. So it's all it's a volume metric, right? And and I met a, with a company here in the innovation lab called Bond. And they're specializing in last mile delivery using these custom made bicycles that carry a bunch of stuff. And they had a really cool video of like the driver interacting with the person. So my point being like that last mile to the customer is really important. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting to think about, okay, Amazon's gonna do it do it in a high volume way. They're not gonna do it in a personal touch way. And so what about the opportunity to compete on those fronts with Amazon? Because Bonds talk about the possibility of, like, maybe you have, in some cases, specialists who come and they can also install whatever it is they're dropping off. Yeah. That it could be much more of a personal type of thing, right? Yeah. Because, okay, maybe you can't compete with Amazon. I'm like, okay, you got it to me 30 minutes. But there's also something very impersonal about Amazon and how they're approaching this. And I think you can potentially combat that. So that's another high point that I saw. Definitely, yeah. I think on those two points, I think, yeah, the the last mile, I think nobody's quite got the right answer yet. There's, I've seen cases for batching deliveries. Okay, you might order three things during the week from three different places, but actually, I need them all on Saturday morning. So, yeah. you know, let, let's let's share those and let's make that a bit more efficient. I think on the other side of things, um, you mentioned that kind of you know delivery and that personal touch of someone building it. You know, IKEA and TaskRabbit is a great example of that collaboration where you get that delivery and then someone will put that together for you. I think. I've, if I'm getting a bed delivered, I don't want to put it together myself. I don't right. think I'd do it very well. I think I'd have a bad back for a while. No so, doubt. Um, yeah, so I think I think there are a lot of different potentials there. It's not been cracked yet, but I think that batching of deliveries and that personal service is, is coming. Um, and to throw one other into the mix, another one that our journalist team that was touring with me really liked was Happy Returns, and they're focused on like basically helping retailers with the return process because yeah. they have to be able to compete with Amazon because one thing Amazon's figured out is ease of returns. Right? Yeah. They've made returns about as easy as you could hope for. Yeah. But if you're a non-Amazon brand doing e-commerce and delivery, how do you compete with that? Well, through a company like Happy Returns, which in theory, if they can aggregate that so that all of their customers, so even if you don't have like a, a Macy's or a Lowe's in your area, yeah. maybe they have a, another participating retailer yeah. you can drop off so it's almost like this co-opetition where the yeah. retailers bond together and say hey we're all going to help each other with returns because yeah. that way we can so anyway i think those things are kind of interesting as far as like how retailers can band together with these types of services to offer the same reach as an amazon or so anyway. 100 percent. yeah there's a, there's a similar company in the uk called doddle who offer the same thing so collaborate with a retailer you can return into an into any into any store with with doddle and i think yeah. it's a great idea um really easy it doesn't take up too much square foot and again you're getting customers into the store which i think is fantastic um i think just to mention on ai as well a company that i actually heard from here and i'm a big fan of is a company called zalando so they've just done a big collaboration with nine and it was a very well attended session but they built their they built their AI from scratch they built it themselves they didn't buy it off the shelf and they now offer I think about 28 million personalized experiences so it's not just your browsing history and it's not just you know things that you favorited but yeah. actually it uses your previous 
previous purchases to really understand yep. the look that's that's best for you. So it's not just you know what am I dealing with that I need to buy now, but actually what have you bought before, what's in season, and what's trendy now, and let's put that together for you. And yeah. I think that's a great example of how you do it and how you build AI and how you implement it properly, like you said. Any other high points for you? Any other yeah, things that I think, inspired you? I think if, if anyone was going to come next year, the one, the one big thing I would say is don't be seduced by the, the big names out there. Yes, they paid the most money and there's some fantastic stands there. Boost, but right? actually, yeah, if you yeah, go yeah. into the basement and you go downstairs, it's, it's, a, it's a bit less glamorous. But that, for me, is where the real innovation is because that's the stuff that hasn't been cracked yet, hasn't been nailed yet. So there's some real innovative stuff there. And I think one, one I saw that was really interesting is, is looking at that facial recognition and, and installed tracking now I know uh, obviously with something called GDPR in Europe and uh, privacy laws yeah. in, in the US it's still a bit of a, a bit of a taboo I guess to track people in store and that facial recognition piece but I think as when that when that does go and I'm sure I think it will over the next few years once once retailers can have a really good idea of what people are not only you know where they're going in store where they're dwelling but what they're looking, what what are they looking at? What are they picking up? What are they touching? What are they, you know, where are their eyes going? That kind of stuff. Imagine the the insight and the data you can get that allows you to curate those stores. So, you know, it comes back to that point, and I think it's been a common theme of this is um, the right store, not just opening a store, but the right store. So, imagine if yeah. you have that data around, you know, what your customers are looking at, what they're liking, what they're disliking in your store. The the design and the curation possibilities for your stores are are absolutely endless. So. I'm looking forward to, to maybe that, that taboo starting to fade over the next few years with privacy and facial recognition. Um, and I think there's some great potential, and I've seen some fantastic solutions downstairs about that. Yeah, downstairs there was action. There There was a CNN crew filming some Bossa Nova robots, so you can be downstairs and still have a lot of action. I, in fact, downstairs I did a, a thing with facial recognition and emotion because I... I always force myself to do stuff here that gives gives me the creeps a little bit. Like it does, doesn't it? The things that I don't like as much. Yeah. It, and and I wrote a controversial thing about facial recognition last year because I got my fi I opted in and got my face recognized yeah. and stuff. Anyway, I did it this year with like it was a emotion based thing, and so it would pop on the screen and say, "John, you're looking sad," and then it would make a recommendation like, you know, you need to go get a drink or whatever. And then it would yeah. have like, a, but I did it because I was like trying to get a feeling for like how this could work like how how recognizing someone's mood could 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 be impactful in a retail setting and i don't know but it was just interesting to kick well, tires on it you know well yeah i think i know luxury brands are looking at facial recognition so say you know you go to Burberry, John, you, you like the Burberry trench coat, so you go in there for the first time, you buy a Burberry trench coat, they recognise your face, next time you come in, they recognise your face again, the server gets told, you know, this is John, right. last time he was here, he bought a trench coat in a medium, you yeah. know, actually, you know, maybe offer him the boots this time, offer him this, and actually the mood is another thing to that, you know, John's just come in, he looks stressed, right. he's, his hair's wet because it's raining yeah, outside, yeah. you might need to give a bit more customer care, so, bring him a I towel think there is, or whatever, yeah, yeah. exactly, offer him a hot yeah. coffee and uh, <laughs> let him calm down for five minutes, but, I think that's a great use case there. Whether or not customers are willing to let up that data in order to get that service, I'm not sure we're there yet, but I hope we will be soon. Well, it was interesting because I went to another facial recognition demo on shopping, and uh, and it was an interesting use case because it was, it was for fast food because like now they have these order kiosks, and the problem with the kiosk is customers like it, but it takes them a long time to order. Yep, yep. And so they have the facial recognition, then it shows you what you ordered last time and blah, blah, blah. So I was pressing the guy on like this issue of adoption mm -hmm. and comfort level, and he was like, he cited a Chinese use case that's doing really well. And I said to him, yeah, but Chinese citizens have basically, like they're used to surveillance. Like surveillance is a constant, like they, yeah. they've already accepted the terms of that. Like that's, that's how they live over yeah. there. It, so anyway, I think it'll be really interesting to see. And, and obviously, if you opt into it in a very clear way, but it's going to be really interesting to see what other countries and cultures and how they embrace that. Yeah, because I, I, I guess, and I don't know the legalities, but you're going to have to have a sign in store saying, you know, the facial recognition is in operation in this store by entering you consent to that. You know, some people might go elsewhere because of that. So, right. you know, that, that's, trade -offs that's a that. risk, isn't it? It's a real risk. So, yeah, we're not there yet, but it'll be interesting to see that. And they also, this company... Um, was also talking with me about uh, potentially a, a convenience store scenario where it would be an add-on to an existing loyalty program so you could opt into it potentially. They're, they're talking yeah. to the convenience. So in that sense, it wouldn't be like a sign opting in. It would be more like 
uh, you're invited to if you want to, and it will give you more added convenience, but you don't have to. So that's an interesting scenario. Yeah, that yeah there, 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 there's a few interesting use cases. I know Walmart uses facial recognition in, in the U.S. as well for, for shoplifters, for those who are blacklisted as well. So that security side starting to come, and, you know, obviously we've all heard about the Amazon Go cashierless stores, but I think if you combine that with a 24-7 store, that's where I can see facial recognition playing. So you don't need service, you don't need anyone in there, but, you know, you can be recognized, you can pay with your face, you can, you can enter with your face. I think that's an interesting use case as well. But I think in order for this to work for customers, they have to tangibly see the benefits that it brings to them as shoppers. And that's when people will start to be a bit more accepting, I think. But until, until real customers start to see that use case and, and the value that this can bring to their lives, I think that's when we're going to see the, see the real benefits. By the way, that was Briarly and NEC that had collaborated on the facial recognition for shopping scenario. And we're going to take a quick break for a cart. <laughs> we've uh, we've been pretty lucky so far. Um, and then uh, one more I wanted to mention was Spoon Guru that I met with. I met with the founder of Spoon yep. Guru. Love what they're doing. It's AI-based dietary recommendation stuff. And that's a whole real-world use case for all kinds of people on specialized diets or with allergies and stuff like that. Yeah, one hundred percent. They actually partner with Tesco, so yeah. the, the UK's biggest grocer. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the dietary recommendations you can get. Obviously, if you have allergies, but obviously veganism is a huge thing now. And yeah. yeah, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And and you look at what that can do. And I think one of the next things I, I'm really intrigued to see is um, I know people with severe nut allergies, things like that. If you go to a restaurant, the chef normally has a big book of everything that's in every food. But actually, one thing that I'm looking forward to seeing in the future with AI is you take a picture of that menu, and it'll tell you all the allergens in there, and it'll. Tell, tell you everything that you can and can't eat based on your personalization and I think that is a, that's a really interesting one because I know a lot of people really struggle with that yeah and and also just the cool thing about that we were talking to the CEO and telling me like how it's really cool that that companies like his can partner so effectively with these large organizations now and I think you're seeing that a lot with specialized services like AI services and so that's another cool trend to see smaller startups with specialized services getting getting a foot in the door yes. with these larger brands. Yeah, so. and I think that's one of the trends I've seen actually over the last three days is is those partnerships and they're absolutely fantastic and I think, yes, you know, there's a lot of benefits to building these things yourselves and you can build bespoke solutions but what we've seen, there's, there's yards and meters of, of, of rows of, um, of vendors out there all who are very, very good at what they provide and I think retailers being able to leverage that and, and really drive that innovation through third parties I think is a huge opportunity and, and someone like Spoon, Spoon Guru is a fantastic example. So one final thing that's kind of on my down list of things that continue to bother me is, um, and, and this certainly isn't an issue with neighborhood goods, um, like, and, and I think they're an example of like a retailer that gets it, but I, I still get really concerned about this employee experience part because I feel like the, there's so much is riding on on the employee interactions and you can talk till you're blue in the face about customer experience and your great mobile app and yep. your in-store stuff but but your your employees to, to pull this off not only do they they have to not hate their jobs for starters yeah um, they have to have the morale they have to have the technology they have to have a little bit of an ability to advise and help you they need a whole different kind of incentives, and I, I, I'm skeptical with retailers right now that they really understand that. I mean, I, I think there's so much of an attitude of, like, viewing employees as cost centers, and I think so much of that has to change if this these sort of visions are going to hold. They call it NRF vision or whatever. If you're going to realize that vision, you, you need a way to do that. And I can see it at high end, like boutiques and stuff, getting it right, because you can just pay your employees more and stuff like that. But I want to see it happening more at scale in larger stores, and I, I, I have yet to really see it. So. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a really interesting one, and and you know they are your brand advocates on the ground every single day, and your store can look great, but you know the customer service side is is massive. And I have to say, being in New York is my second time here. I see a tangible uplift in the customer service and the experience I have here compared to the UK. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's absolutely fantastic here. Uh, but, you know, places like Converse, Nike, Adidas, those yeah, places, yeah. those store associates are world class. They're fantastic. And yeah. I think it's absolutely great. But you they go back are, to the UK. And you go back, like, to, back to the UK, <laughs> you put your headphones in and you go to the self-checkout and you don't really talk to anyone. So it's a bit of a bit of a different ball game. Um, but yeah, I think, it's, it's, you, like you say, it's, it's empowering those employees. And I think 
Uh, a really interesting one is Hero, so Adam Levine, you know, what, uh, a, one of the real successful retail startups. Someone like Chloe, who was on our panel, are using Hero, and, and what that allows you to do is if you're looking on their website and you want to chat with someone, it's actually the employee in store who you chat with. So they're the ones who know the knowledge, they're the ones who know what products are in that store, and they're the brand advocates. So you don't need to be talking to someone who's in a customer service center offshore or, or somewhere else, nowhere near the store. Talk to the people in the store. They're the brand advocates. And actually, those employees are therefore rewarded accordingly. And you're absolutely right. There's, you can't just, you know, you've got to incentivize this. You can't just say, you know, you serve that customer in this way, you use this technology, that's great. But actually, it's turning them into those, you know, those sales right. people, those advocates. But it has to be incentivized and it has to be well trained and executed. Yeah. And, and look, I'm sure there's some activity there. I'm just saying that I still think that's a weak, yeah. weak link that I yeah. see. Um, I want to do a brief shout out to the happy or, happy or Not. The CEO of Happy or Not was willing to meet with me, even though I was openly critical of his company um, in our email interactions. Just because I'm a little skeptical of the average person just getting in a bad mood and slapping a button and saying, I had a bad experience or whatever. I think sometimes you're catering to the customer too much. Like, But we had a really good talk, and there's an article forthcoming on that. But Yeah, I'm always fairly skeptical with those buttons because I can also imagine a store manager standing there pressing the green one a thousand times every morning. Gaming so, it or uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the kids pretending to play drums on it. That's not an accurate yeah. representation of your store experience. Yeah. Uh, but it is potentially interesting too and I'll, you, you guys can check my article on Diginomica when it comes out because I'll write it up. But but there's some potentially interesting things you can do with that data. And, and the CEO was a real gentleman for a meeting with me when he knew I was going to give him a grilling. Yeah. Um, and uh, any, anyway, it's kind of a long story because I think it comes down to, I was giving him crap, but it's really more about, I think when you plug that type of data into the wrong culture, it ends up being punitive on employees rather than empowering. So it's really more of a culture problem than a technology problem. It's not his technology's fault, I think, to a large extent. I think it's how it's used. But anyway, that's an interesting discussion. Yeah, yeah massively, and I think it, that data... It's great in isolation, but it needs to be pinned back to, you know, that store experience. What happened on that day? How many employees did right. we have there? What was going wrong? How was the merchandise that day? Yeah. I'm really starting to understand the root cause behind these things. I'm just right. blaming an employee or the store experience isn't good enough anymore. Yeah. You're really being able to track that data and, and work out the root cause of these things because that's when you start empowering that data for its best use. Got it. Okay, any other final weak spots you see for retailers they need to think about? or? Yeah, I think, I mean... Things like the Kishila store, I think, is, is still massive, but I don't think anyone's quite cracked it yet, and I'm not sure whether that is really something we need to be going after. I know, obviously, in the U.S., there's a lot more, you know, dense, larger cities than, than in the U.K., yeah. but I really think that, that convenience, again, I don't want a retailer to have spotted the Amazon Go or seen the Kishila stuff and think, that's fantastic, that's what we need to go after, because, right. again, it's understanding your customer, you know. What is, what is that convenience that they need? Is it really Kishila's? You know, we've, already, we've all read the stories around Amazon Go and how they have to actually employ actors to start walking out of the store with without paying because customers just you know didn't really 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 see it work and and actually in the UK Sainsbury's tried something similar with something called scan and go and they actually scrapped it because people were going to the customer service desk trying to pay there so really understanding your customers you know are we there yet I'm not quite sure so I think the one thing I would say is is to retailers is I wouldn't be seduced by these, these flashy things that you know look great and sound great without really understanding the root cause of why you're doing it and how it fits into your long-term strategy. Yeah, I like that. We had a situation locally um, in my town where of a lot of folks who don't like it because they tell me um, they want they don't want to see their jobs going away. Like they see it as a form of automation and they want people in the community to have work. Yeah. They, they don't because yeah. if they go everywhere and there's robots and automation everywhere, they start to think about the li the health of the community. And I think that's an interesting question for retailers to address: is how to do this in a way that feels like you're part of the community and not just automating the hell out of it. One hundred percent. And I have to say, sustainability again has been an absolutely massive piece of um, piece of the the conference this year compared to last year. Yeah. And I think actually this this planet over profit that I'm hearing lots about that comes back to that as well. Yes, there's the the diversity piece and and the the plastics and the carbon footprint but it's again yeah you're right it's communities people want to be affiliated with brands they're proud to be affiliated with and if you're a brand that is you know is known for you know firing people in the community and, and you know and, yep. and causing those issues right people don't want to be affiliated affiliated with those brands anymore and, and like right. I said before the competition is so rife out there you lose that brand affiliation I'll go elsewhere right yep 
Well, we could talk further. I think we've we've nailed down a lot, and we haven't been rudely interrupted too much, so I think <laughs> we should quit while we're ahead. But um, thanks for giving me your quick thoughts on the conference. It was great to sit down with you. Thanks, John. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it.